Well, and welcome to the worship of Almighty God by this part of His family, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you are here today. Welcome on this Independence Weekend as we also come to the table and recognize our complete dependence on Almighty God who has given us everything. We're so glad you are here and we would love to take a moment and just quiet our hearts now, be ready for the worship of Almighty God. We have so much in store today. God's Word is just rich for us, and uh, we need to be prepared for it. So take a moment in the privacy of your own heart, and then let us worship God.
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. For this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for us. And God raised up us up with Christ in order that he might show the incomparable riches of his grace so that we might receive adoption, no longer slaves, but God's children. For this is what the Lord says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. So by God's grace, we declare, now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. Therefore, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's hand.
Lord, with the angels on high and those surrounding your throne, we declare that you are holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You who was and is and is to come, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and power and glory and strength, for you have created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And in love, Lord, you sent your Son to come and redeem us. Lord Jesus, you declared that you had come to set us free, to declare freedom to the captives, those in captive, captivity to death and fear and darkness, that we might walk in the freedom as children of God through faith in you. We thank you that you seek us out one life at a time to add to your kingdom that we might become your bride. Lord, on this weekend, we give you thanks that we can gather together in freedom. We thank you for those that penned a document so long ago and in faith and with courage and great loss to themselves, they forged this nation. We thank you for those that have sustained it for those that have gone into harm's way for us. Lord, I ask that you would move your spirit across our nation in a, a new renewal. You have done this in times past, and we ask it again, that you would bless our country with a spirit of repentance that our hearts might turn and we would be open to you because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So bless our nation with grace and humility and with the peace and the salvation of Jesus Christ. And Lord, on this day, we declare and thank you for the Lamb of God who was slain, that you will receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and praise. And Lord, we join together with those at the throne to declare your goodness and your love. Lord, as we gather with our families this weekend, I pray that each of us would share how precious they are to us. That each day we would look at those with whom we share life and time and see them as a precious gift, loved by the living God. May we be instruments of your goodness to those that stand opposed to you, to those who are not open. May our hearts be filled with love and patience and grace and gentleness, that they might taste the goodness of our God through our lives and our words and our actions. That, Lord Jesus, that you would reach one life at a time through your church the body of believers who know your name, until the day of your return when we look up and see you coming in the clouds from on high and your kingdom will come in all of its fullness and its glory. Until then, Lord, may we be instruments of that kingdom filled with love and tenderness and grace for those around us that all might taste and see that the Lord is good. For it is in your name we pray. And God's people said. As we receive the offering today, one of the reasons why we give it is so that we can touch another life with the good news of Jesus Christ, just as someone touched yours in times past. That here through the ministry at St. Andrews and in cooperation with other churches in the city and county and missionary partners around the world, that the good news of freedom in Christ Jesus is for all who would believe. Amen?
Amen and amen. Well, will you pray with me? Almighty God, thank you. Thank you for your truth, and may it be brought to bear now in this time, and to that end, would you give to me the gift of preaching that what I say here today might be a word that you have for your people, and so help us all to lean on your holy word, written down, brought to us because of your deep desire for truth to be in our lives, and may we follow that truth to the life that is Jesus Christ. In his name we ask it, amen. Well, aside from uh, warm weather and too many fireworks, if you ask me, summertime and brings vacation, and also a sermon series that you see on the screens right now called Q&A, Questions and Answers. We have questions we would love to ask God, don't we? It's one of the few things we look forward to when we die, right? When I die, I'm going to ask God about that. I just don't understand. The interesting thing is that God has questions He wants to ask us, and that's what we've been looking at, is the questions that God asks. And the interesting thing is when we allow God to ask those questions, the answers that they bring out are from the very depths of who we are and whose we are, and today is no different. In fact, I would suggest to you today the question that we consider is question zero. It is the bedrock, the foundation the most important question God ever asks. And so I invite you to turn in your Bibles to, to uh, page 1527 in the Bibles in the pew. It's Matthew chapter 16, beginning with the 13th verse. Jesus has been teaching with His disciples. He has been healing. He has walked on water. And now, they come to the region of Caesarea Philippi, a very pagan location with uh, a shopping mall filled with different idols and deities to worship. And it goes like this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets, but what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, wonderful. No, actually, that's not in the Scripture, but I think there's that kind of power to it. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The pilot of Aeroflot fly, Flight 593 thought he was giving his two teenaged children a thrill by letting them sit in the pilot's seat of the passenger airplane. It was an Aeroflot flight from Moscow all the way to Hong Kong, and this is before uh, 9-11, so who got into the cabin where the pilots would do their work was a lot more relaxed than it is today. There was no lock on the doors and things like that. True story, a pilot named Era Kaczynski invited his 13-year-old daughter and his 15-year-old son in, and actually his 13-year-old daughter said to him as she started sitting in the chair, she said, raise the chair, Daddy, I can't see out. This is the kind of people that are flying that plane at that moment. It's a long flight, it's dark at that time, they're over Siberia, and, and most of the passengers are asleep on this uh, Airbus A310, if you know your planes. And Kudrinsky, of course, thought he was giving his kids an innocent thrill because he had programmed the autopilot to turn a little bit left and then turn a little bit right and then come back. And so, when he told his daughter, turn the plane to the left, oh, look, it's going left, Daddy. Turn the plane to the right, oh, look, it's going right. He thought the autopilot was doing it, but it wasn't. 
Actually, the autopilot was working on everything but the Aerons. I don't know all of this sort of stuff. I just know the story and, and what the newspapers say. So when his 15-year-old son took the, the, the steering column, he was a little more forceful than his sister. And so the pilot, the, the, the plane went a little, a little to the left, and then it went right, and then it went right some more, and then it went right some more, and then it stalled and started to nosedive. Are you shocked that uh, this would happen, that two teenagers would be allowed to steer something as important as a commercial airline with all sorts of paying customers asleep or resting in the rest of the plane. Does that surprise you? Hold on to that feeling. Because you may not have thought of this before, but in the story you and I just read in the Bible, when Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am, he is about ready to do something pretty amazing, and we usually go right by it. After he asks them, and through them you and me, the greatest question of personal faith that can ever be asked, who do you think that Jesus is? He then says to those people who believe, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Your confession is the rock on which I will build my church. It's as if he hands over control of the most important movement in the entire cosmos, something you and I often casually call the church. He hands it over to sinful human beings like you and me. And so let's have a look at this passage and figure out how in the world we get to this position. So I invite you to have a look at it because it begins with what uh, they call in the interview game a softball. An open question, pretty simple. And it's really asking, what news organization have you been watching recently? Who do people say that I am? You know, and you've got your conservative folk and your, 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 your left of center folk and all that sort of thing. Some say, they say, John the Baptist. Those are probably the left of center folk. He's kind of a revolutionary. Some say Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. And by the way, all of those things are very complementary to any itinerant rabbi. Wouldn't you agree? These are all kind of the pillars, the, the big names of religious movements of that day. You know, practically everyone we meet, atheist, agnostic, longtime believer, it doesn't matter, just about everybody we meet, if we say, what do you think about Jesus? They would be complimentary, wouldn't they? They would say things like, you know, even the, 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 the most staunch atheist would probably say something like, well, he's a great mystic, a wonderful teacher, he was a good man. And Jesus probably treats their compliments the way he treats the disciples' statements here. He does not care. He goes right by them, doesn't he? He says nothing to that. That's not what he's getting at. He's just trying to draw out the disciples. Who do you other people think? But how about you? That's where he goes next. Who do you say that I am? He gets personal and asks this question. What about you? And it's no simple question. I submit to you, it is the question on which hinges all of your life and mine. You, what do you think? Individually, just you, in your heart of hearts, what do you think about Jesus? What have you said about Jesus? And not just with your words, but with your life, with how you wake up tomorrow morning, with the priorities you set, with how you write the next check that you write, whether it's to the church or somewhere else, do you realize that Jesus is Lord of your life and your finances? 
Do you realize that Jesus is in charge of how many days you have? That Jesus is in charge of your comfort or your suffering? Do you realize these things? This is the question He's asking. Who do you say that I am? You know, it's so easy to let the people around us or the organizations we're a part of or the things we're told to say be our voice about this. But Jesus isn't asking that. He asks you and me, who do you say that I am? What about you? That's the way He begins it. Not the church you attend, not the hymns you just sang, not the creeds you might speak, as wonderful as all those things are, it doesn't take the place of you or me simply saying, I don't care what anyone else thinks, this is what I believe about you, Jesus. And so there came a time in your life and mine probably when we decided that our parents' faith was no longer our own that our community faith did not define us, and we took that on for ourselves. And so just as it did on the road to Caesarea Philippi, the question hangs in the air for you and for me, and God is asking you for an answer. He always is, and He's waiting for a response. And I don't know how much of a pause there was between Jesus asking the question and Simon Peter answering the question. I'd love to know, wouldn't you? And some people think Simon Peter just got it all of a sudden. I happen to think that Simon Peter simply spoke for all the disciples who had seen Jesus feeding 5,000 and walking on water and all these other things. And so he, on behalf of the group of people that was there, simply said, well, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's his confession. Let's unpack that for a moment, though. The Messiah means the long-awaited King who has come from God to deliver people for God. It's to, the, the, the power of God brought into human form so that you and I could have what we need, what we cannot make for ourselves uh, that allows us to be in fellowship with the one who made us. And you and I can often call that forgiveness of sins, but in general it's called salvation. It's rescue of whatever you and I are in that keeps us from God. And then Peter goes on, and here you have to be interested. He splits with all his ancestry. He says something completely revolutionary as far as his Jewish background. He says, you are also the son of the living God. In other words, God has become in human form the one God that Israel spoke of that no one could look upon is now a human being that we can look at and touch and watch and see and feed as many of the, the disciples often did and watch get tired and sleep and wake up. Amazing. And after, Jesus, after Peter says this, Jesus gets excited, doesn't He? His lack of excitement when He's so complimented is contrasted by how excited He is now. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood did not tell you this, but my Father in heaven. Let me pause right there and ask you a question. Have you ever made that confession yourself? Have you ever said that for yourself? And if you're wondering right now, I encourage you, I encourage you before head hits the pillow tonight, 
Find someone who is stronger in their faith than you feel right now and tell them of your confession. I guarantee you it will change your life. Do it after our worship service with people who will gather to pray for you. Do it at any time. And we're going to give you an opportunity in a moment. But let me just ask something that probably all of us have done as well. Have you ever waited for someone you love to make that confession for themselves? Have you ever been praying for that child or that friend or that parent or that coworker to make that decision? And you're speaking to them and you're trying to get them to do it. <laughs> and that works really well, doesn't it? I want you to hear Jesus. In either one of those circumstances I just described, hear what Jesus just said. This is... This is a work of the Spirit. This is something God does in a human heart. Now, that doesn't make us passive. And if you're waiting to make that decision, there's a decision of will that you need to make. But please don't wait until every single question in life that God might answer gets answered because you will be waiting until after the day you die. You can't logic yourself into this decision. It doesn't work that way. Believing faith is kind of like, have you, have you ever seen a, a parent, t Timberly and I were just traveling and we watched this a number of times in, in, in these, these places that don't have a lot of escalators and they get to the airports and they have their little two-year-old or three-year-old toddler, you know, on the hand and they come up to the escalator and the toddler goes, And the toddler's nervous to do this. This is something different. Do I make this decision? And then once they do, what happens? They just start moving and moving upward. They don't have to do anything else. That's what faith really feels like. It's that first decision of the will, and then you realize that God is in charge in a whole new way. And so begin with that decision and see if God moves. And if the escalator doesn't move, and by the way, there are airports like that too, but if the escalator does not move, then you can say, God, what's going on? I still have in mind a two-year-old jumping on that escalator. And to those who say yes, who make that confession, Jesus responds, he responds like this, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. On this rock, I happen to think, and I may be different from your view or the church that raised you, but here it is. I happen to think that what the rock that Jesus is talking about is Peter's confession, not Peter individually, but his confession. And so it transmits. It transmits to every leader of the church. It transmits to you and to me that on this confession, Jesus is building his church. I think that's fascinating. Every other world religion is based on the teachings of its leader. And I don't know if you realize this, but in various ways, Muhammad, Confucius, Buddha, they all said in, in, in a number of different ways, that they would not mind if they were completely forgotten as long as their teachings remained. And Jesus is almost the reverse. He says, the number one thing about me that you need to know is not my teachings, but it's me. It's my nature, the fact that I am God Almighty, come to earth to rescue you as King and Lord of your life the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And if you know that, then you will want my teachings. But let's start with what's most important. And he says, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I'd like to take a moment with that. Because think about it with me for a moment. Gates really don't move. How can the gates of hell overcome 
I often thought this was, you know, the church is there and hell is beating against the church and the church just kind of holds fast. That's our job. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's actually referring to where in Jesus' day an invading army would attack a walled city and when it had thoroughly conquered that city, it would rip down the gates off their hinges of the city so that anybody could walk in and out, that all the defenses of the city were no longer useful. The army was basically saying, we have conquered this. The gates, we have been overcome. There are no more defenses. It is fully subdued. So here's what's going on. Jesus isn't saying the church simply resists hell. He's saying the church, you and me, we actually attack hell itself. And we subdue it. And hell doesn't stand a chance. Its gates will be torn down. Now, I got to say, the history of the church, past and present, doesn't always fill me with that kind of confidence. The church has been the root cause of some amazing atrocities over the years. And our arrogance, our ignorance, and our aloofness has sometimes been a great sadness to the culture around us and to us. So we can do a bad job of this, let's be honest. And we have in the past. But God has destined us and given us the controls to tear down hell itself. And that's something that's just amazing. So let me take one more moment and simply say, when our new lead pastor arrives, I hope we will be open to new ideas, to ways that we have not yet thought of, perhaps, to attack hell itself, to change the frustration and the sadness and the bitterness and the hopelessness of the world around us and sometimes the hearts within us through the ideas of a new person and it might, it might for those moments, it might attack or feel hard for you or me as if we were holding on to our petty priorities and our, our sense of preference about what we'd like this church to look like. I got a chance this last week to talk with Jason. And we talked how the church of Jesus Christ, and this is my analogy, not his, so don't blame him if you don't like it. <laughs> it's like a child on a swing. And as the child wants to go forward in the swing, what do you do? You lean back and you kick your feet forward. Right? And if you do one without the other, what happens? You stop. The church of Jesus Christ is always at its best when it is leaning back into its great traditions and past at the same time kicking its feet forward into the future. That's what we need to do. And I just want to invite every single person here, and this is my moment to speak to all of the membership of this church, to say that's got to be a part of our minds. We've got to have that looseness of petty preferences, that we go, oh, it kind of hurts to give this up, but I know it's not central to the gospel of Jesus Christ, what God's doing. Because Jesus has given us the keys. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm shocked and terrified that teenagers with no training would ever get to steer a passenger plane, and yet here it is, Jesus commits control of the greatest force the universe will ever know, one that is going to attack hell itself. He hands it to us. We should hold it well. Because He gives control to all who make that confession. And so I need to ask, have you ever made that? 
if you're struggling to make that confession today, if you're waiting for another question to answer, if your faith is fumbling to confess Him, to believe, to trust in Jesus Christ, my sole offer of comfort to you is this. Have a look at what He says about the church and realize as you're struggling to have faith in Him that He already has faith in you. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank You that You are ruler of us all, that You love us completely. Lord, as we begin this celebration of our independence, it's only fitting that we come here to this table and to this day making a declaration of our dependence. And so remind us, Lord, as we come to this table that we come as beggars to the feast and you are the only sport, source of our spiritual food. We need you so much. Our nation needs you. Our leaders need you. And so help us now. Speak through this time. Watch over this meal in Jesus' name. Amen. And so it's my privilege to remind you, dear friends, that our Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, as we have, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, so all of you drink of it. And we know as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's been a long time since this has been the meal. We've had these for a long time. Nobody boo or hiss. <laughs> Necessity, we understand. But what we'd like to do today our leaders think we're ready for that moment and people feel safe enough that we can come forward. And so what we'd invite you to do on whatever aisle you are, whatever place you are, come to the nearer aisle to the center. So this aisle here and these two aisles here, if you would do that, come forward, receive a piece of bread, take it for yourself, just eat it right where you are, and then take a cup bring this back to your place where you're seated. So walk back on the outside, back to your place of seating, and we'll celebrate it together as one body later on. We also want you to know if that is still something that your doctors or your sense of safety would like you to not do, we still have these, and you can come forward and simply ask for uh, a self-contained cup. We will offer that to you. There's also some up here and back there, so you can just let us know. Also, there are gluten-free elements, and we want to let you know that if you are someone who just can't, you or someone near you cannot make it to the front, simply let us know, and our ushers will direct our servers to that point, and we will serve you because we want everyone to feel served. There also, by the way, is one station up in the balcony, so you folks nearer to God get to do that over there. <laughs> and so this is our opportunity to receive, and here's what I'd like to suggest. As you take the bread, the reason we do this is because we believe Jesus is more than a teacher, amen? And so if you have never made that confession, let your taking of the bread and the cup be that confession. But if it, that is for the first time in your life, don't let it stop there. Say it to someone today. And so would the servers come forward, for the table is ready.
There's a wonderful thing that happens to me that hasn't happened for a couple years now. When the top comes off of this, the aroma of the grape, of the vine, it just comes forward. It's something every pastor appreciates. May the aroma of God's grace and His goodness be with you. May it linger with you in the days ahead as you make that decision with every step of your day to confess Him as Lord because He has given His all for you. Dear friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And would you pray with me once again? Almighty God, we thank You. We thank You for the privilege of knowing sacrifice. We thank You that, Lord, we can look to this weekend and know that sacrifice is at the center of what we do and the reason for our celebrating. So, Lord, would you give to this country the compassion to match her dominance and the wisdom to direct her resources. And, Lord, teach us anew, each one of us, that righteousness alone exalts a nation. And you make nations to rise and fall, and none of us have earned your blessings, but each of us can be good stewards of them, that they have been sacrificed for us by you and by your dear Son. And so, Lord, help us in this day and the days ahead to praise you for the many blessings that we have, and remind us, Lord, to send up this weekend not just fireworks and barbecue smoke, but also praises to God for how good you are to us and how much you offer to us and help us to seize hold of those promises. And we ask all these things, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer, as we say together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, dear friends, we have just a few things before we close our worship. I want to invite you to take the, uh, uh, the bulletin that you got as you came in, because there's some wonderful things going on in the days ahead. Big Wednesdays is beginning. It's a Wednesday experience through the summer. You can see that if you, uh, uh, if you look to the right side of the panel. There's a number of other things going on. We're going to be celebrating and appreciating the gifts and the leadership of Gary Watkins on the 17th. And so we invite you to come in two weeks to be a part of that as well. Uh, That's going to be a time just to celebrate and bittersweet for all of us who've gotten to work with him. After he prayed today, I actually said to him, you know, if you do that a few more times, I'm going to start missing you when you're gone. (laughs) Because he's just been amazing. And so we invite you to do that as we celebrate God's goodness to us in so many ways. We also want to let you know that next weekend there will be a time when you can hear a little more about what it means to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And so uh, we invite you to do that. The registration for that Holy Land trip is going to get a little more expensive by the end of the month. So we're hoping that uh, people can make that decision. And next week between the services, we'll have some times to do that. And you can find information on the plaza today and next week as well. These are just some of the things that are going on. I also want to do one more thing because our choir has served us in such amazing ways. And we don't usually say anything because we want to reserve all the glory for Almighty God. But these people have led us in worship and in ministry and in singing, and we're so grateful for them. And we can stand. And and I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume from your standing that you are now volunteering for the summer choir. 
which we want to say begins next week. And by the way, you only need to come at 7.30. It says 7 o'clock there, but we're going to give you 30 extra minutes. And so you can be at that time and be a part of the choir for that day. And uh, good news for you and for me, you don't have to rehearse beforehand. You just come. And you don't even have to, like, be tested for how well you sit. Anyway, it's going to be wonderful. So, dear friends, for all the joy that this weekend can offer, for all that we have just experienced, I get to offer you this benediction. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord, and know that the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit goes with you now, is with us always, as we proclaim what we believe about who He is to the world. May it know. Amen.